Uh, so I am starting recording now. Uh, so that they can pick up the class later. Okay, uh, Thursday afternoon. I don't know if you noticed, you get, I, you get a notification on whether or not I mark you absent or present. How I run that is off of this little piece of paper, which is my sign-in sheet. For those of you that are present, for those of you who are participating online, I get a digital copy of when you logged into the class, when you logged out of the class. So if you don't sign that sign-in sheet, or you're not on my online record attendance, I'm going to mark you absent. You come in late, or you don't get the whole hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to mark you as well as probably late. If you do find, like Thursday, um, I marked two people absent. I caught one on my own, and the other guy sent me an email. The other student sent me an email and said, hey, I was there. Um, make sure that you've signed in. So, I still got a minute. I click on the people. There should be a whole bunch of people online, right? Or we all decide that we're still recovering from our three-day weekend, or we showed up to our Monday classes instead. That was an extremely interesting video you shared. Really? Um, I was curious what your thoughts I, were. I watched it three or four times, and I may or may not share it with you guys later in the class. Um, like I said, I, I think that they could have approached that differently mm -hmm. uh, instead of the automatic, you know, let's start cuffing people and arresting people and not explaining to the rest of the crowd that this has been a recurring problem between these two women and we're just going to separate them because the crowd got involved and it's never a good thing kind of you know had moments or memories of the morgan whalen concert in pittsburgh this weekend did you see that mm. no um i'm gonna ask especially the ladies um have you ever been to a concert or any major sporting event where there's like 50,000 people there. What do the lines like the bathroom look like? <laughs> and unlike a guy who can just go around behind the dumpsters and take care of business, um, takes a while. Well, they had seven or eight porta potties there. And the, uh, one of the girls skipped the line. It caused a riot. And, uh, people were beating each other up. One poor girl got swished in the porta potty. Um, it, is, it was a disturbing video to watch, but kind of like the ones that you showed. And we're going to be talking about that today in Elements of Crime. So, the topic of today's lecture is Elements of Crime. I have my chat room open, so if you have any questions, uh, you can type them in, or if your microphone's working, you can just interrupt me. Um, this should be a fun discussion, I hope. But before we can get into the elements of crime, we have to go back to the beginning of the social contract, because crime is the enforcement of a social contract. So even before families, there were individuals. Back in caveman days. <gasps> Anybody watch Tim the Toolman Taylor? Yes. Okay. So, 
Um, or Ray on Everybody Loves Raymond. Okay. Back in caveman days, we were individuals. We fought for ourselves. We found our own food. We did what we wanted. There was nobody that could control us or make decisions for us. And as we're walking through the cave, we see a young, as a man, I'm a manly man with toxic masculinity. I'm walking and I go past a cave of a woman that I like. Ooh, I find her attractive. So what do I do? Back in caveman days, I smack her over the head. I grab her by her ponytail. I drag her to my cave. She becomes my wife and we have children. Has much changed today? Well, yeah. Gotta take me to dinner first. <laughs> okay, so this created families. And now the heads of the households and the heads of the families had to protect their family. And then I have two sons who helped me protect my family. And if you ever come by my office, you can look on the wall. And you know, this past weekend was my 38th wedding anniversary. Oh, yay me. Poor wife. Had to deal with me for 38 years. But 38 years ago, it was just us. It was me and my wife fighting against the world to make a life together. And if you come, and yes, I've got the marriage pictures there, but I've also got a picture of a picture that we took last May when my daughter graduated from university. Okay, so not only is there my wife and I, but I have four children nine grandchildren, and three sons slash daughters-in-law. And there's an ex-wife and her kid from her new marriage that are all part of what started 38 years ago as us, me and my wife. As the head of the household, my wife is in charge, and we all know that. Um, but as the head of the household, it's my job to protect the family. And this is what we did, or this is where we evolved, is to where families took care of their own, much like street gangs today, right? You diss my gang, I'm gonna kill you. No insult can go unanswered. No offense against my family can go unanswered, and it starts a blood feud. So you kill one of mine, I have to go kill one of yours. I've killed one of yours, you're going to come back and you're going to kill one of mine. And then eventually, like the Hatfields and McCoys, we're just all going to meet on an open field of battle and kill each other. And this is how the families worked. And then as society grew, as families grew, we created societies themselves. And this is the creation of the social contract or the social compact. The social compact tells us or gives us obligations. It gives us rights, it gives us liberties, but it also gives us obligations. Can I go up to you and beat you on the head, drag you into my cave and have my way with you anymore? No, that's called rape. Can I, if you left your lawnmower out on your front yard, can I go take it? Can you, with your brand new Camaro, come spin donuts in my front yard? No, you can't. But on the other hand, can I go beat you into a mud hole? Because you offended me or my family. You stole something from me. You raped my wife or one of my daughters. One of my daughters has a t-shirt that says, my dad's a little crazy. He loves me, though. And if you mess with me, they will never find your body. Yes, he bought me this shirt. And yes, I bought both my daughters that shirt. From what I heard over the weekend, I'm going to have to buy one for my granddaughter as well that says, Grandpa teaches serial murder, so he knows how to get away with it. 
<laughs> I am so glad when I was in high school and junior high school, my granddaughter's in junior high school, that I didn't have to deal with social media. You know, the bullying when I was in high school was bad enough. But now with Instagram and Snapchat and all of this crap, you guys have to deal with? I'm sorry. But we get this feeling, we get this belief that we are allowed to do so, right? Because it's social media. The social contract says, I cannot infringe upon your rights. And if you infringe upon my rights, the government will seek vengeance for me. That kind of goes against everything from the families and the groups. But in order for us to live together in a society, regardless of our the color of our skin, regardless of the God that we pray to, regardless of who we love, we have to have the understanding that it's up to the government, the society at large, to seek vengeance for us. If somebody offends us, we go to the police. The police investigate, they send it to the DA, the DA charges, the jury will convict you and sentence you to prison or whatever punishment or whatever sanction that they see fit. So in the United States, this starts with the Declaration of Independence. And I want to read part of it to you. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whatever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles as organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evil, evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. This is the second paragraph out of the Declaration of Independence. Did I read it too fast? You guys read it before? Okay. September 17th is coming up. It's September 17th. Constitution Day. Or is it the 19th? The 19th is the rapture, so it can't be Constitution Day. That's what I heard over the weekend. One of the rapture teachers said that the rapture is going to be on the 19th of September. So make sure you get all of your assignments turned in if you plan on being raptured. But you can still get an A in the class. I'm teasing. Um, what did that paragraph say to you? Everybody has equal rights, and the government is tasked to protect those rights. Should government be able to sway or change themselves based upon let me get the exact quote, transient causes? If Dr. Perry was in here right now. He'd probably be telling you that the government is this humongous ship. We'll call it the Titanic. And the Titanic and any major ship goes in one direction. And it takes forever for them to turn. The Titanic was even worse because its rudder wasn't big enough for the ship. So when they saw the iceberg, 
they couldn't get out of the way of the iceberg and it sunk and died and everybody died except for the little except for the woman that had the ruby in her hand <laughs> she was nice and safe on the door while her lover was freezing to death in the water Move over, woman. Give me part of the door. <laughs> um, but if we, we don't want a government that swings back and forth because of some transient cause that a minority of the country believes or follows. And if the country does, if the government does do that, then we as a people have not only the right, but the obligation to rebel, to destroy that government and to start a new one. But what the writer of the Declaration of Independence said was that we're okay with suffering a little bit, Right? We're okay with, let me read it again. Mankind are more disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable than to abolish that evil. So what does that mean to you? Somebody on Teams help? Don't make me start calling names. I have to sign in. What does it mean that people or mankind are disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable? Yes, sir. Sufferable, and we're forced that we're being forced to suffer. Essentially, that like the analogy you made earlier about the government and the Titanic, it takes the government forever to try to stop to stop evil. They have to get certain you know missions and stuff like that to try to stop them. While while they're trying to do that, they find a way to stop evil. Evil's already affecting us. Because of the right. Anybody want to add to that? So let's imagine for a minute, if we can, that we live in San Francisco. I know, I just, the captain of the SWAT team the, for the San Francisco Police Department just, just graduated from here. He always hated it when I used San Francisco as my example because, you know, San Francisco needs to be the example. In San Francisco, what we have is a group of individuals who go into stores, they just steal everything. It has gotten the habit of people who have parked their car on the street to leave their windows down. So they won't, so people won't break into their car or break a window to get into the car. And you can drive down some of the streets in San Francisco and you know, everybody drives the SUV now with the hatchback. All the hatchbacks are up. So that you don't have to break a window or destroy a lock or a door just to get into the car to find out there's nothing there but the insurance forms. And because nobody has a whole box of CDs anymore because we all listen to our, our phones. We listen to Pandora. I, my neighbor over the weekend was celebrating Labor Day, and he was playing Latin, uh, Latin music, Hispanic music, uh, really loud and bothering me. So being the nice, charitable, giving neighbor that I am, I have this humongous sound system that's built into my RV. Uh-oh. <laughs> and it's... So I got my, I've got some Scottish bagpipe music. <laughs> I slapped that into the CD player. 
<laughs> and cranked it up as loud as it would go until the speakers started popping. And I turned it down just a little bit. So I think I was running yeah, probably 27 or 28 decibels. Couldn't hear anything else. Walked down to the end of the street. All you could hear was Abaddon and the bagpipe music. And then I went back to the house. I turned it down so I could be okay for me to sit there and listen to. And I looked over at my neighbor and he just said, Lo siento mucho. <laughs> you do it again, all you're going to get is Scottish bagpipe music. You play country, you can play rock, you can play classic rock. If I can't understand the words, I don't want to listen to it. Just jam to the notes. Uh -huh. Jam to the notes. Jam to the beat. You don't got to understand it to feel it. Okay, so our Declaration of Independence sets our social contract. The Constitution of the United States gives, well, let's go there. Constitution Day is coming up, and I'll go, I have a whole lecture on the Constitution. But what powers does the Constitution give the government? Heston? None. None. What does the Constitution do? It gives it to us. It gives the power to the people and limits the power of the government because the government can't be trusted. Caesar Beccaria or Baccaria or he's Italian. I don't know if I don't speak Italian either. Huh? I don't hear you saying. I was just thinking, so you said it was Italian, I was thinking Cesare, Cesare Bacara, but I don't think so. It's close enough. Okay. Am I right now kill belly at Caesar Bacaria or Bacaria? <laughs> Who is he? Who's this guy? He's an Italian man. He was the second born. He was the marquee of something or another. He was trained to become a priest for the Catholic Church. But he left the Catholic Church because he didn't believe in what the church was teaching. Specifically, the church was teaching and society believed that if you were a criminal, if you were somebody who violated the laws of nature, the laws of God, and the laws of man, you were somehow possessed by the devil. You were in league with Satan. Caesar Bacaria, Bacaria, just know whichever way I say his name, I'm talking about the same guy. <laughs> Caesar Bacaria said that, or he believed, that people had a rational manner and that they apply that rational manner toward making choices that will help them achieve their own desires and their own personal gratification. Because that's what we're all interested in, right? And we're interested, our world, our lives, our flesh may it be is about seeking and finding gratification for ourselves that's why i'm told you know, back up how many of you had an online class with me how long are my lectures <laughs> with 45 minutes and an hour yeah, yeah. I am told that you, millennials or Gen Zs or whichever we're on now, are incapable of maintaining your attention span beyond seven minutes. And that every seven minutes, I need to change the topic, change the subject, change the story, so that I can re-engage your brain to what I'm having to say. You notice how I do that? I'm talking about Caesar Bacaria. Caesar Bacaria said that we all have our own choice. We make rational choices for us to gain the most immediate gratification 
and satisfaction. Jeremy Bentham, who was one of his acolytes, turned around and said, and he declared what's called the hedonistic calculus. And what's the hedonistic calculus? Anyone? Anyone? Nobody's ever heard of the hedonistic calculus. Okay, the hedonistic calculus, let me channel my very best Dr. Beach, is a cost-benefit analysis. And what Caesar Baccaria and Jeremy Bentham both told us was that we, as individuals, make a risk-benefit assessment on every decision that we make. Well, I don't want to skip school today because why? Fisher might say something important. That's not likely. Um, Fisher's going to count me absent. I'm going to miss a lecture. I need to be there. I need to be online so I can watch and I can listen to what he has to say. Because he doesn't record these lectures. I am today. But normally he doesn't record these lectures. So you're going to miss something that's going to end up on the test. You're going to miss something on the quiz thingy that you have this Sunday. Let's do this Sunday on the D on DWI. Okay, I'm going to tell you all about the penal code once we can get there. It'll probably be Thursday before we get all the way there. But what is the risk for taking this action? What's the punishment for taking this up? We'll go to my favorite topic, which is sex. But let's talk about peeping toms. A peeping tom is going to give or use the risk benefit to being a peeping tom. What's the benefit to watching the figure of your sexual attraction through the window, getting naked or doing whatever they do in their bedroom. What's the benefit? Mental image. Say that. Mental images, lusts, manual manipulation, ejaculation, orgasm. Are these all good things? Let's, let's take the peeping Tom out of it. <laughs> Is sexual release a good thing? Sexual gratification is a good thing, and we all seek it. Unless you're a monk or a nun. You know why they're called nuns, right? They ain't getting nuns. <laughs> <laughs> but what are the risks of watching through a window, watching, in my case, a, a woman get undressed and be naked and do whatever women do in their bedrooms. Okay. Uh, getting arrested. caught, ma'am. Arrested. arrested. Getting arrested. Getting caught, getting arrested, having me catch you looking on one of my daughters. You wish the cops would come get you. So, What's the likelihood that you're going to get caught? Puny. What's the likelihood you're going to get punished? Big. If you get caught, or you get caught by me, it's big. But Caesar Beccaria said that part of this risk benefit assessment is that we look into the type of punishment. If punishment is swift, certain and proportional to the crime, it should deter us from committing that crime. Why? I know I shouldn't say this too loud because I'm in a school, but I'm going to say it anyway. Why do I not bring a MAC-10 to school and kill everybody? You can get arrested. Get arrested. This is Texas. It's a death penalty state. I'm afraid it means. Why do I not beat my wife? Get arrested. 
Do it's that. not morally acceptable by society. It's not morally acceptable by society. I will lose my right to carry a firearm because it's domestic violence. So I lose my job. I will never be able to work in the criminal justice field again. But primarily because there's no reason to beat my wife. We've been married for 38 years. <laughs> I know who's in charge, and it's her. Um, so Caesar Beccaria said that if we know what the punishment is, and that that punishment is swift, it's certain, and it's proportional to the crime, we will be deterred from committing crime. So let's bring some politics into it. Let me offend everybody. Do we remember the Summer of Love 2020? Did you know that it was called the Summer of Love? The BLM riots after the murder of George Floyd? Where several major cities were burned to the ground? There were 49 people murdered? There was a captain of the St. Louis Police Department that was shot and killed in the streets of St. Louis. And somebody streamed it on Facebook. That, the, 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 that particular case, he was just arrested. When he was arrested in 2020, he just went to trial last month, and he was sentenced to 22 years in prison. It's Illinois. Um, but what about all of the rest of the people that burned things down? Not a sing other than this one murderer, not a single conviction. So if we you look at that as an example, or the people that are running around stealing all of this stuff from the stores in California and New York and Illinois, you know, just don't try it here in Odessa because we believe in Jason Aldean, right? Don't try that shit in this town. <laughs> um, if you're not going to get punished for it, and you're not going to be prosecuted for it, and this is what the DA in San Francisco said, if you steal something, if your theft is less than $1,500, we're not even going to prosecute you for it. So what are you going to do? I'm going to go steal up $1,500. I'm going to find food. I'm going to find them, them shoes. I'm going to get 10 pair of the newest Air Jordans. I'll put me right at about $1,500. And they don't stop you. I watch these videos with the cops standing on the sidewalk while people are running out of the store with everything they've got, and nobody stops them. So Cesar Bacaria says that if it is swift, certain and proportional, it will deter you from crime. I'm not seeing swift, certain, or proportional, are you? John Locke. Anybody know who John Locke is? Heard of him? These are all philosophers that tell us about the social contract. We've been talking about the social contract for 31 minutes now. John Locke's Social contract theory, um, and if you're following on the PowerPoint on Canvas, I think it says Jason Locke. Yeah, yeah. but it's not Jason Locke, it's John Locke. Um, his beliefs and thoughts on the social contract theory says that government was created through the consent of the people to be ruled by the majority unless they explicitly agree on some number greater than the majority. John Locke brought us the idea of majority rules. Granted, majority rules goes way back into ancient times. But he's a philosopher from the 1600s that said that the social contract and the purpose of government is that the majority will have the say. But if you don't want 51% or 50 plus one, then it has to be more than a majority. In order to convict somebody of impeachment, you have to have 75% or 
And the reason why President Trump was not convicted on his impeachments and removed from office was because they didn't have the supermajority to do so. Okay. This week, we're going to hear a lot about impeaching President Biden. Do you think it will get a conviction? No, because they don't have the votes in the Senate. They don't have the supermajority in the Senate to do so. And John Locke believes, or John Locke thought, that every man, once they've reached the age of majority, they have the right to continue under the government rule or not. You can just separate yourself from the government. You can separate yourself from the social contract. You remember signing that social contract? You remember agreeing to the social contract? Okay, so next time you talk to your mom, Say, Mom, do you have a certificate with my feet prints on it? That was your signing the social contract to agree to majority rules. Do you know why we say bless you when somebody sneezes? It comes back before Caesar Beccaria. Go ahead, Mark. It was... Uh some divine meaning. As a divine meaning. Isn't it like when you, like, when you sneeze, it's like an opening for a demon or something? It is. It dates back to pre Caesar Bacaria, and every time you sneeze, it opened up your innards for demon possession. So we would say, bless you. In German, it's Gesundheit, which means good health. Because the other idea was that if you sneeze, you're getting cold or you're sick or something, so we wish you good health. Why do people sneeze? So allergies, trying to get something out of the system. Something that irritated those little sensors in your nose you needed to get it out of your body. It does not mean you're necessarily mean that you're sick. It could be allergies. It could be somebody's wearing perfume that disagrees with your nose. Allergies. <laughs> okay. Hobbs. Thomas Hobbs. I love Thomas Hobbs. He's my favorite guy. And if you are a criminal practitioner, he should be your favorite guy as well. Who's Thomas Hobbs? And don't say the tiger on the Calvin and Hobbs cartoons. <laughs> Who's Thomas Hobbs? You know, the philosopher from the 1600s, he said that the purpose of government is to control the behaviors of the individual. Because we are all free to do what we want. But my freedom does not extend past my own nose. Just because I have the freedom to do something doesn't mean that I can do it. And Thomas Hobbes said that the purpose of government is to ensure that you don't break society's rules. And that if government does not control the behaviors of the masses, the masses will turn to chaos. And we've seen that in the last three years. We have seen, we have watched our society crumble because government is not enforcing the rules. Government is not enforcing and maintaining control. So we're getting chaos. So how does this relate to Texas criminal law? Texas criminal law has two categories of laws, misdemeanors and felonies. Can somebody define a misdemeanor for me? Yes, Samuel. Uh, misdemeanor would be a uh, misdemeanor would be a minor offense. Okay. Misdemeanor would be a minor crime that isn't 
It would still be punishable, but it would be like a like a, like a traffic ticket, parking ticket, something like that. That would be a class C misdemeanor. How many of you name? Your name? Carolina. Carolina. Adelina. And what were you going to add to it? Uh, yeah, it's a crime punishable by fine or less than a year in jail. Less than a year in jail. It's a minor fine. It's considered melee prohibita. We're going to do some Latin today. A misdemeanor is a melee prohibita crime or offense. And what does melee prohibita mean? It's prohibited by law. Being a prostitute is melee prohibita. It's a misdemeanor. DWI, for the most part, it is melee prohibita and it is a misdemeanor. Bouncing a check, it's a misdemeanor. Melee prohibita. A felony, what's a felony? We'll get to the punishment here in a second. But what is a felony crime? It's a major crime. It is melee and set. Which is another Latin term. And I told you I didn't speak Latin. Melee and say means evil within itself. I don't need to tell you that it's bad. I don't need to tell you that it's wrong. If it's melee and say, you know it's evil. Kidnapping is evil. Rape is evil. Murder is evil. Serial murder is evil. Extortion, bribery. All these things are wrong. And we know they're wrong. They're melee and say. So, punishments for a class C misdemeanor. It's a fine not to exceed $500. Your traffic ticket. Yes, sir. Um, I heard that um, for like the, with restaurants, like the, uh, ordering a lot of food and then just leaving without paying, if it's under 500 it's a misdemeanor over it, you can be convicted for a felony if caught, right? I don't know if the number is 500. I think the number is sitting at 15, at 1500. But yes, if you dine and dash, uh, there is a dollar amount. I, I'll look for that dollar amount, but there is that. I don't know. Um, I guess that's what makes me a better professor than most. Dollar um, but a class C misdemeanor to traffic tickets, not to exceed $500. Jaywalking, public intoxication. These are all class C misdemeanors. A class B misdemeanor is no more than 100 days, 180 days in jail. That's six months. And a fine not to exceed $2,000. A class a misdemeanor, a year in jail, and a fine not to exceed $400. These are your misdemeanors. These are minor offenses. DWI, first offense is considered a class B misdemeanor. But you can have, find yourself on probation for two years, paying probation fees of $60 a month, every month for two years. You have to pay for a intoxilizer that gets hooked up in your car that you have to blow into it and it'll tell whether or not you're drunk or not so your car will start. And that is $200 a month for two years. You have a $2,000 fine, and then you have a $6,000 service fee that you have to pay to get your driver's license back. And then you have to get, you have to pay for an entire year's insurance. And a new law that just went into effect this past Friday 
if you kill a parent in DWI, you're paying $500 a month child support until that person graduates from high school or turns 18 years of age, whichever is last. Okay. So in Texas, most people don't graduate high school until they're 19. I graduated at 17, but I didn't go to a Texas high school. And my, I discussed this with my, my, my wife is 55 weeks younger than me. She failed the first grade. So that should tell her father killed himself that year and it was just horrible for her. Um, but she should be two years behind me, right? Yeah, that would be cool. She should be two years behind me. I graduated in 1984. She graduated from high school in 1987. How did that happen? Yeah, figure out the math and let me know. <clears throat> felonies. There are four categories or four levels of felony. The first one is a state jail felony. Or a fourth degree felony punishable by between 180 days and two years uh, in the state jail a possible fine not to exceed ten thousand dollars and what really sucks about state jail is it is day for day so you get sentenced to two years in state jail you are spending two years in state jail you're not getting out early you're not getting put on parole you're serving two years and then you're gone. And then you're you're released. A third degree felony is punishable by two two to ten years, and a possible fine not to exceed ten thousand dollars. Second degree felony, two to twenty, in addition to a possible fine of not to exceed ten thousand dollars. You're spending twenty years in prison. How are you going to pay a ten thousand dollar fine? When you get released, you get put on parole, you will not be released from parole until you pay off that $10,000. First degree, up to 99 years and a fine not to exceed $10,000. And capital punishment or capital felony. A capital crime. Life in prison without the possibility of parole or death. I'm afraid of neither. And they won't let me use old spark. Okay, so yes, sir. I've heard cases where people get like multiple uh, life uh, life. Uh, sentences like what what significance is that? Okay, well, it would depend upon there's concurrent serving consecutive or concurrent. So if you have more than one charge or more than one offense, and let's say you're convicted of possession, manufacture, distributor of cocaine, it's typically at two to ten, let's back up one. At two to twenty, it's a second degree felony. It's typically two to twenty. Uh, you are also charged with aggravated sexual assault, which is a first degree felony for ninety nine years. And let's say you also killed her, which makes it a capital offense, which qualifies you for life without the possibility of parole or the death penalty. If you are sentenced to consecutive, you are going to serve the 2 to 20. Then once you finish this one, you start the next one. Once you finish that one, you start the next one. Now, if you're sentenced to concurrently, all the time adds up. So you never want me to become a judge because I will never sentence somebody to concurrent sentences. Everybody will serve consecutive. Meaning once you finish your first offense, 
Then you start to charge for the second offense. Then you start to charge for the third offense. And what our DA does, I like our DA. Our DA will send you off to prison for a charge. He will only try you for one charge. Let's say possession. You get sentenced to five years. He will send you off to prison for five years. And then he'll put the detainer on you. So that when you finish that five years, you're brought back to Dr. County, where he's now going to charge you with rape. And he's going to send you back to prison for up to 99 years. And if you get out, he's going to put the murder charge on you and send your ass back to prison. I like our DA. I'm voting for him. Because I don't, I don't, if you commit more than one crime, shouldn't you do more than one time? But that's my opinion. Now, if I ever find myself on that side of the bars, I want them to all count together. <laughs> so, how we deal with breaking the social contract here is we send you to prison, especially if it's melee and set. It costs the state of Texas $62.34 every day to keep you in prison, which means you, the taxpayer, are paying $95,000 a year for every inmate in prison. We have 265,000 inmates in the Texas prison system right now. Somebody do the math for me because my math don't work that well. Times 95,633. Without a scientific calculator, you could be able to read it? Uh, 20, 25 billion, 342,000, or million, 745,000 dollars. So that's a billion with a B. Yeah. We'll just say about $25 billion a year to keep, to house our inmates. Are you happy with the money that you're spending? Yes and no. Yes and no. Oh, I've lied. There's 158,000 as of this uh, yesterday. So redo the math. So we're looking 18 million or 18 billion. 15 billion. 15 billion. I already did the math. <laughs> 15 billion, 151 million, 40,557 dollars a year that we spend and we send to the prison system. That's not counting insurance for our staff, training for our staff, the, the Wyndham School District. The Texas prison system has the Wyndham School District so that you can finish your high school diploma or get a GED. And if you pay for it, you can go to college. The state's not going to pay for you to go to college. Your family has to do that. But they bring college professors into the school. They teach you a trade. They teach you all kinds of cool things that's above the $15 billion. What does the $15 billion go for? Food, clothing, electricity, health care. Okay. <laughs> so the elements of a crime. Yeah. We're going to talk about more Latin now. Actus reus. The act of committing a crime. Okay. Yeah. So, if actus reus refers to the act or the lack of an act that comprise the physical elements of a crime. Can you be convicted for not acting? Let's say... If you're a first responder, First response. Let's say I sit up here and I plan with you a bank robbery.
and I'm going to go rob the Wells Fargo across the street. And I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. I'll tell you everything that's involved with me committing this crime. And you do nothing about it. Are you guilty? Yes. You are an accessory, an accomplice. You will go to prison for the same amount of time as I will, and I'm the one that robbed the bank. You know, we've got this motto in the street. It's called snitches get stitches. But I tell you this, I ain't going to prison for your ass. <laughs> if you admit to committing a crime or you're about to commit a crime, hey, Mr. Popo. <laughs> George Jones says he's going to drive drunk again tonight. So actus reus includes only voluntary actions. And I get into this debate, it's a religious debate. Well, we'll just tell you a story. 1985, February, March of 1985, I was in Wichita Falls, Texas at Shepherd Air Force Base. And I was what was called a rope. I was a yellow rope, and it, which means I was in charge of the hollow. Okay, so I was the squad leader for the hallway. And there's the red rope, who's the commander of the hallway, and then he had four or five yellow ropes who were responsible for different sections of the hallway. And it was my night, it was a Saturday night, and I was in charge of the watch which means I had to patrol the hallway to make sure that the other people, the other guys in the dorm, weren't doing anything stupid. And we're talking about 18, 19 year old kids, um, young men, 18, 19 years old, first time away from home, in the military, the drinking age was 18. What were we doing? Getting stupid. So, <laughs> I'm patrolling the hallway, and these two guys come in the hallway. They spill out of their dorm room, and they're fighting fisticuffs. As my job is to restore order, I go to break up the fight. And it turned into this melee at the Morgan Whalen concert. I think there were 13 of us. And I'm trying to pull them off and set them down and do my job as the cop. Radioed into control to have them bring the MPs, and I am pulling off, and then I just said, Screw it, and I started swinging. <laughs> Somebody grabbed me from behind, put me in a headlock, and rammed me into a concrete wall. Um, the cops and our commanding officer found me unconscious in the shower. So we had a community bathroom, so I don't know if you guys know what those are. Um, we had 15 toilets and 15 urinals and 15 shower heads all in the same room. I was in the shower part of the bathrooms, with the showers on, soaking wet, blood everywhere. And they found me. Commander grabbed me by my arm. She was a major, and I just decked her. Damn. Uh, I'm an E1, knocked out the major with one punch. And I was then woke up again. I didn't know that I did this at the time, but I woke up in the hospital, handcuffed to the bed. I go, what's wrong? What, what's going on? He goes, do you know what you did? I said, well, what I do know is that there was a fight. I called the police. I tried to break up the fight. And then I woke up here. The doctor said, uh, you also put the major in the hospital, too. I go, what major? Your major. And I go, I'm... 
No idea. When they released me from the hospital four days later, I went straight to the major and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that I did this. And she goes, yeah, we've talked to the attorneys. We've watched the video. And I go, you have video in the bathrooms? <laughs> and she goes, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, she goes, we realize that your action was not voluntary. And because your action was not voluntary, but instinctive reaction, there's going to be no charges filed against you. So I'm probably the first person in the history of the United States Air Force to knock out a major and get away with it. <laughs> so actus reus must be voluntary. You must know what you're doing and why you're doing it. The next is mens re. And this is where Mark was at. This is the mental state. This is your mental intent. Not only does the action have to be voluntary, it must be your intent. It is my intent to get behind the wheel of a car when I'm drunk. But I'm drunk. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But that is mens re. Mens re is the intent. It's your state of mind. It is a guilty mind. Concurrence. And this is where a lot of people get in trouble. So I'm gonna I'm going to bring Donald Trump back into our world because he's got 91 indictments against him. Oh, yeah. Democrats are not playing this year. <laughs> they, do, they do not want Trump running for president. I don't know why. He's 81 years old. What, what, can, what damage can he do to our country? He's 81? Yeah. He's as old as President Biden. They're the same age. Yeah. <laughs> so there are, and I really like the ones from Georgia. The indictment, we're just going to focus on the indictments from Georgia because they arrested him, they took his fingerprints, they booked him, they took a mugshot of him. Hey, I saw the mugshot circling around. No, he's, <laughs> I got a t-shirt that has his mugshot. <laughs> he's selling, he's made $10 million towards his campaign since the mugshot. Genius. <laughs> but what, what is the state of Georgia charging Donald Trump with? Ballot manipulation, trying to overturn a election, but more than that, they charged him with RICO. And RICO is organized crime. And that's why there's 19, including Trump, there's 19 people that were indicted. And only Floyd has been kept in prison or in jail. Everybody else is out on $200,000 bond. Except for Mr. Floyd, because he's a flight risk and they're afraid that he's going to continue to commit crime. He is the, he's the director of the nonprofit organization known as Black Voices for Trump. And they won't let his him out of jail. I was going to say a bad word, but um, ending with ass. Uh -huh. We're all adults here. It's fine. We're all adults here, yeah, but it's offensive, so I won't. You know what word I'm going to use, right? <laughs> um, they're keeping him in, in jail. They won't let him go down on bond. So the state of Georgia has proven actus reus because Donald Trump tried to influence the vote counters to change the ballots and to change the electors. What the problem is, is they have to prove the men's right. They have to prove that what Donald Trump did was that he knowingly tried to overturn an election in a different way than Stacey Abrams did, in a different way than Hillary Clinton did, in a different way than Al Gore did, in a different way than any Democrat has complained about not winning an election. 
concurrence is that your actus reus and your mens rea must be present. Causation refers to the relationship of the cause and effect between one event or action as, and as a result. It is the act or the process that produces the effect. Okay, so let me give this. Let's say I decided that I want to rob the Wells Fargo across the street, and I figure out which wall the safe is on. What's ex exterior wall the safe is at? I start drilling a hole into the wall to get into the safe. And then halfway through it, I decide, you know what? This is stupid. I'm not doing this. And I walk away. Have I robbed a bank? But there is mens rea in it. There's an act of attempted at bank robbery. There is my mindset, my guilty mind, which means that there's occurrence, and I took action to commit the bank robbery. Now, as whereas we have the minority report, you guys all seen the movie, The Minority Report? Yeah, Tom Cruise. Awesome movie. Put it on your must watch movie list during winter break. Just because you think about committing a crime, just because you talk about committing a crime, does not mean that you've committed a crime. You must take action towards committing that crime. It is causation. And the last is punishment. Punishment is just that. It is the sanction or penalty given for any crime. And how we go ahead, Mark. Could you still be charged with conspiracy to commit a crime? Yes. That's how we get around that. But if I start drilling a hole into the bank, I've taken an action to cause or to put that into effect. And that's what the RICO is. It's about conspiracy. But you still have to have some kind of causation. What steps did you take to commit this crime? We could sit here all day long talking about robbing a bank. We can make the plan to rob a bank. But until any of us, now we're into RICO, but somebody has to take a step in the causation to make this action come into effect. But yes, the penal code has conspiracy to commit. Okay, so criminal homicide. We'll talk about criminal homicide. I've got two crimes that we're going to discuss um, today and Tuesday. The first is criminal homicide. Criminal homicide comes from Title V, Chapter 19 of the Texas Penal Code. Crimes against persons. A person commits criminal homicide. If he intentionally, knowingly, recklessly, or with criminal negligence, ends the life of another person. So, what does intentionally mean? Purposely doing On purpose, knowingly. Oh, having the, the mental sanity to act upon. Let's put our thinking caps back on for a second and imagine, if you will, that you have. Seizures. Epilepsy. Epilepsy. Thank you very much. Let's imagine, if you will, that you have that you know you have epilepsy, and that these seizures cause you to black out. But you need to get to class because Dr. Fisher counts attendance. Your ride isn't here. So what do you do? You get in the car to drive yourself to school. In the process on 42nd Street in Dixie, 
you have a seizure. You run a red light. And you kill somebody. Is that an accident? Or is it knowingly? Is it recklessly? Or with criminal negligence? What you've done is committed homicide because you knew better than to drive because you have seizures. That's why if you have epilepsy, they won't give you a driver's license until you've gone six months without an episode. Criminal homicide is murder, capital murder, manslaughter, or criminal negligent homicide. So let's look into intentionally and knowingly. Was the person's conscience ob objective or desire to cause the result? Okay. When my former son-in-law, whose body you will never find, <laughs> beat up and ran over my daughter, did I knowingly go after him with the intent to kill him. Yes. Yes. That is intentional. I'd like to plead crime of passion, but it's four miles from my house to my daughter's house. Just so that you know, I didn't kill him. <laughs> I did pay for the divorce, and I hired an attorney, and I had his name removed from the birth certificate. Yes, my daughter gets no child support from him. He gets no visitation with my grandchildren. I'm an asshole. But if I were to kill him, and that was my intent that night, if I didn't have that four miles to calm down, <laughs> I would have to be pleading a crime of passion. Knowingly, as the person is aware that his conduct is reasonably certain to cause a result or an end okay, and this there's a case in big spring it rarely rains around here and for some strange reason everybody drives a four by four <laughs> so we got a really good rain back in 2013 and these high school kids from the big spring high school went out into some farmer's field and started spinning donuts he was in a pickup truck. He had nine guys in the bed of his truck. Guess what happened? One of them fell off the truck, bed of the truck and got run over as they were spinning the donut. The dryer, driver of the truck was charged with manslaughter. Why? Because he didn't, he didn't intend to kill him. He knew that what he was doing could end up as a result of death, but he didn't intend to. He was stupid, 18 years old. Yes, Mark? What's the difference between that and you? There isn't. It's the same thing. You know that if you're getting behind the wheel with epilepsy, you might kill somebody. You might have a seizure and kill somebody. So it's similar to like the risk reward factor where you know, yes, I have epilepsy. Yes, I could have a, a, a session, an episode on my way to going to school, but that's the risk. But the reward would be making it on time in class, not missing a lecture, not getting marked absent. And, and so you being, I could kill someone. And so you make happen. you make the rational choice of what you're going to do. A short definition on purpose. Okay, so we've got three minutes to the end of class. Well, I can get through recklessly. If a person is aware of but consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk, back to our rational choice, back to making the decision to drive, back to the decision to spin donuts, you're making a reckless decision. If you make a reckless decision that causes somebody's life, you're going to prison for it. 
You should have known. But, you know, here in Texas, we have that favorite saying, right? <laughs> you funny. Hold my beer. <laughs> and that, I, that, that should be the motto that's on every 20-year-old person's back window. <laughs> You're funny. Hold my beer. <laughs> Negligently. When a person acts when he ought to be aware of the subs of the risk, but he does it anyway. Back to our epilepsy. Yes, sir. So say that person takes their medication, the doctor's cleared them, they have another episode. What's that fall into line? Still it's the same. One more time. I'm like sorry. say say the person's on medication that the doctor prescribed. The doc, like it's been past that period. It's been past the six months. Yeah. The doctor clears you to drive. Yeah. The state gives you your license. You drive and go have an episode. Yeah. In the end, they're taking the medication. So. That's not right. Okay. No, I just don't. It's, you know, you're, you're being told by your medical professors, professionals that you're safe. Yeah. Much, much like McConnell. You know, McConnell had that stroke on Friday. Huh? Oh. And Senator McConnell has got a medical problem where every so often he has a mini stroke it's where he just freezes oh, yes. he stops talking he doesn't know what he's going on and when he comes back to he doesn't know where he is he doesn't know anything the man needs to leave yeah. he needs to go back to 91 he needs to go back to north carolina and he just needs to retire kentucky and have a good old time much like diane feinstein much like John Federer. Who? Who? These are Democrats that are suffering from this. Diane Feinstein had a massive stroke. Her, she gave full power of attorney to make decisions for her to her daughter. But she's in the Senate making decisions for all of us. John Fetterman can't compose a sentence to save his life. If you remember at the beginning of the semester, at the beginning of my lecture, I sat there and I just stopped for a second. I said, oh no, I'm suffering from a towel. Uh, <laughs> Should have known better, but you didn't do it. Okay, we will, somebody tell me, or I'm on slide 13, somebody remember it for next time. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Hope you learned something today. Have a good day. Actually, Dr. Fisher, can yes, you go back to the uh, recklessness slide, please? Yep. Not long to say anyone over 80 should not be in office. No, I agree. Let's put both of our running leading candidates for president to both retire. 